Deputy Murphy. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you both. You're both very welcome. Um, Mr. Burroughs, I'd like to, before we talk about your time on the board and Mr. Crowley, I'd like to just go quickly to the night of the guarantee to get a few things on the record, uh, if I may. Um, Mr. Fitzpatrick and Mr. Drum came to see you on the afternoon of the 29th of September 2008 looking for help for Anglo Irish Bank. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. How long did that meeting last? Not very long. I would say that. Uh, uh, maybe 30 minutes, 45 minutes. In, in refusing to give assistance to Anglo, did you or Mr. Goggin say that the Bank of Ireland had its own problems, and that the bank might also run out of money if things continued as they were? Uh, no, we didn't. We, we listened to the um, uh, case that the executives from Anglo had to make, uh, their plea for help. Uh, they asked us if we would consider taking over Anglo, if we would consider buying any part of Anglo, uh, they were looking for any kind of assistance at all uh, that we could offer in a situation which was clearly of the utmost severity in terms of that uh, default which they were likely to have the following morning. So you didn't give them any information as to your views of, the, of your own bank's own position at the time? The discussion was all about Anglo. Okay, thank you. And then you initiated the meeting with the government, is that correct? That's correct. And did you do that at Anglo-Irish Bank's request? Absolutely not. Okay. Uh, how did you initiate that meeting? Well, if I take you through uh, the subsequent events, uh, we, we met with Anglo. Uh, I had a pre-scheduled -pre meeting with the governor of the central bank uh, to talk about other matters which had to do primarily with uh, wholesale funding and collateral uh, for funding. Uh, and I took that opportunity that afternoon uh, of explaining uh, to Mr. Harley uh, the visit that I'd had from Anglo and uh, explaining my concern uh, at the very difficult situation which could result from this uh, default uh, the following morning. And I asked if, uh, if there was any plan in place in the central bank uh, to deal with this situation. Uh, and I was somewhat surprised uh, to find out that there was not. Uh, and uh, it was Mr. Hurley's guidance to me uh, that uh, if I wanted to take matters further, uh, that I should make an approach to government. Okay. And did you make that approach then through him to government, or did you make no, that separate? No, I didn't. I, I went back to Bank Rand. I discussed the situation with uh, my chief executive, uh, and we resolved that the right thing to do was to make sure uh, that government was fully aware of the severity of the situation facing Anglo. Uh, we also felt, and there had been a lot of discussion over prior weeks and weekends, uh, in the central bank involving both allied Irish banks executives and our own executives in relation to other issues in the marketplace. Uh, and we felt that uh, it could well be that AIB uh, would feel uh, similarly about the severity of the situation and that it therefore uh, might be better if we made a joint approach rather than an approach on our own. And so I rang uh, Dermot Gleeson, chairman of AIB, uh, and explained uh, the situation uh, as I saw it, uh, explained that we were going to contact government and invited him to uh, join us in that approach, which he readily agreed to. And then you went about setting up the meeting. Correct. And was that by making a phone call to the Minister, to the Taoiseach, to the Secretary General? Uh, a phone call was made out of our office in, in Bank of Ireland to the Taoiseach's department, and as a result of that, the meeting was set up. Okay. Um, you say in your written opening statement that the immediate funding problems of Anglo could have been dealt with at the time with a guarantee from the government of the $10 billion of, in financial support that both you and AIB were willing to give. And that was your view at the time. That's right. If I, if I just go back to the sequence of events uh, that evening, um, uh, we, we, the four of us went to uh, government buildings and we were uh, eventually shown in to uh, meet with the Taoiseach, the Minister for Finance, and quite a number of other uh, people were there. I can't remember all the names. Um, and uh, I led uh, on behalf of the four of us to explain to the Taoiseach and the, the other members who were present, uh, the reason for seeking the meeting, uh, which was to make sure that they were fully aware of the severity of the situation uh, that could unfold the following morning. And the, 
uh, impact that that could have on the banking situation at large. And then my uh, other uh, colleagues on that uh, visit uh, made their own interventions with government, at which point uh, we were then uh, invited to go into an anti-room, uh, whilst uh, the Taoiseach and Minister and the others present uh, conferred, and eventually we were uh, brought back in to meet with uh, the Taoiseach, and at that point uh, Mr Harley, who was present, asked if uh, Anglo-Irish's uh, Anglo default could be, could be covered by uh, Bank of Ireland and AIB uh, providing liquidity in the form of 10, million Euro, 10 billion euros the following morning. Um, our response to that, um, and it, I think it was Brian Goggin who articulated this, uh, was to say that we would be prepared to go away and consider that uh, but that uh, given the severity of the situation, given the difficulties which we were all facing, uh, we would need to be guaranteed by government on that particular loan. Not just guaranteed about the loan, but guaranteed that we'd actually get the cash back too after a specific period of time. Okay. So and, at this point in time then, was the discussion around a, a possible four bank guarantee? No, it has nothing to do with four banks or any number of banks. We it just had to do with Anglo and resolving uh, the situation with Anglo. Okay. Um, and so after that uh, discussion, uh, we went back to the anteroom. Brian Goggin contacted his colleagues in uh, Bank of Ireland. I imagine Eugene did the same thing. Uh, it's a complex matter to raise that kind of uh, liquidity in the middle of the night. Uh, but nonetheless, after some time, uh, they managed to do it. And at that point, we were called back into the meeting with, uh, with government. Uh, and we, we said that uh, subject to that condition about uh, the loan being guaranteed, that we could in fact, and I'm talking for Bank of Ireland, come up with five billion, not the following morning, but the morning after is the best of my recollection. At that point, and, and, and AIB confirmed their, their participation to the same extent, at that point uh, we were informed uh, by the Taoiseach that the government had decided to introduce a guarantee of all deposits for all the Irish banks. And there wasn't any question about six or four or anything else. It was for all the Irish banks. Um, and at that point, we left. Can I just clarify on that point, then, Mr. Yeah. Rose? There was never any discussion of a four-bank guarantee with Anglo and Nationwide being taken down, to use Mr. Gleeson's phrase. That was never considered while you were there or not. There, there was discussion at the meeting with government about whether the appropriate thing would be to nationalise uh, Anglo, uh, and that uh, was clearly ruled out uh, by government in the discussion which we had. Okay. C can I take you, if I may, just to one of the evidence documents? It's BOI C3B, it's pages 9 to 11, and it's a note from that night of the meeting. Um, and uh, the beginning of that note is the list of attendants, and then there's uh, bullet points, comments attributed to you, Mr. Burroughs. Um, I don't know if you have this note in front of you. I, I've seen the note in the papers, yes. Um, there are ten bulleted points attributed to you, but Mr. Gleeson, when he was before us, said that he believed that only the top two lines were comments that you made, and the other eight were his comments. Can you confirm if that's the case? I can certainly confirm that I uh, talked about the first point, uh, the second point, uh, and I talked about uh, Anglo. Um, I'm really not sure about the, the other points, uh, and I am and I, I'm, I'm pretty certain, in fact, I'm absolutely certain uh, that I didn't uh, myself get into any discussion about INBS mm -hmm. uh, or any uh, question about uh, any guarantee. So it's that bullet point seven where it says reminded action, two elements, A, guarantee for surviving, B, troubled patients to be taken out. You think that was Mr. Gleeson? I can tell you it certainly wasn't me. It wasn't you. Okay. Um, but at that point in the conversation, uh, from your recollection, we were still talking about only a guarantee of the 10 billion that AIB and BOI would provide. Well, I really am not sure uh, who made that note or at what point. Uh, if I go back to the sequence of events as I described it to you, in the first um, meeting which we had, we described the general situation, uh, the international and domestic situation. We described 
the particular threat uh, resulting from Am Anglo's uh, precarious position. Um, and uh, there wasn't any discussion at that point about uh, the remedial uh, action to be taken. That happened at a second intervention. And can you recall any draft document or piece of paper in the possession of Mr. Goggin with a possible draft of a guarantee or a list of institutions that a guarantee might cover in the meeting? No, I can't. We, we, we didn't go... We didn't go in with, uh, with a solution to propose to government. We went in to uh, make government aware of the concerns which we had. And it wasn't for us to propose anything. It was for us to make government aware of the seriousness of the situation and then try and respond as best we could. Do you recall AIB having any such document or piece of paper? I don't. And uh, did you know that a guarantee of your, of your institution might be on the cards prior to your arrival at government buildings that night? I did not. Okay. Did you know that a system-wide guarantee might be on the cards? I did not. Okay. Well, if we could just go to page 20 of the same document. Um, there was a meeting earlier that day in the bank at which Mr. Goggin informed uh, a small committee of which Mr. Bankster was a member about the possibility of a government guarantee being provided for all borrowings by Irish institutions. Um, so Mr. Goggin, according to these minutes, would appear to have been aware that it was a possibility that the Bank of Ireland could become part of a guarantee before he went to government buildings. Did he discuss this with you? I, I saw this uh, paper in, in the documents that you provided, uh, and uh, I made my own inquiries. And uh, I, I, first of all, to your question, I was not aware, not made aware by Brian Gargan, uh, that there was any uh, pre-discussion about a guarantee. And subsequently, uh, when I saw this memo uh, uh, or minute, I inquired, and uh, I have established to my own satisfaction that that is an incorrect minute. It did not happen. The, the minute is incorrect in its entirety, or...? The question of any uh, uh, preparation of any guarantee at that point was not discussed. Okay. But, but the knowledge as to the possibility of a government guarantee being provided for all borrowings by Irish institutions, that, was that discussed in that meeting? I know you weren't I, present. I can't tell you. I, I, but Mr. Gargan never... Uh, said anything to you no, he didn't. along those lines? No. Okay. Thank you. No. Um, when you were in government buildings that night, did you know the bank's borrowings at this point in time, um, customer deposits into bank borrowings or debt securities issues? Did you have an idea of the exposures? Of Bank of Ireland? Yes. Yes, I did. You did. And Mr. Goggin? Of course. Um, and just to clarify then, when did you become aware of this systemic guarantee? It was a second meeting or a... a my recollection is that it, when we came back to report to the meeting uh, that we had, with AI, been, been successful in uh, putting together the 10 billion to resolve the situation with Anglo, it was at that point that we were informed that a guarantee was going to be put in place. I think the, the government made um, a reference to the fact that they were going to have to call some kind of a cabinet meeting in the middle of the night uh, to authorise this, but that it was planned that the uh, creation of the guarantee would be announced first thing the following morning. The guarantee for all the six yes. institutions, as it happened. Yes. Okay. Well, my, my last question in relation to this area, Mr. Burroughs, if you could turn to page five of that same document, BC, B, BOI C3B, and it's board minutes from uh, the 3rd of October 2008, and it's where the events of that night are recounted to the board. Yeah. And it says that when the decision was conveyed that AIB and BOI were prepared to provide 10 million collectively, the mood of the meeting lifted considerably, and the government side began to focus on the draft press release to announce the blanket guarantee with immediate effect. And by blanket in that instance, you understand the guarantee of the six institutions. Yes. Because in the following paragraph, it says, in the event, market developments triggered the guarantee earlier than expected. In these circumstances, the political judgment was that it had to apply to all banks. So is there a change there between I, what was agreed or what you understood to be agreed when you said you could provide the 10 billion and a blanket guarantee? Could that blanket guarantee refer to the four banks? I, I don't think so. No, I, no, I think it, it always referred to all banks in my mind. But the following paragraph then, in the event market developments triggered the guarantee earlier than expected, and in these circumstances, which would seem to indicate different circumstances, the political judgment was that it had to apply to all banks. There seems to be an inference there that there was a change in the well, scope of the guarantee. I, I, I honestly can't get into the, um, 
actual writing of that minute as to, but I, I do know that we had the board and we, Brian Gargan and I, reported very carefully on what had transpired. Um, I, I guess the, the, the fact of the announcement of the guarantee on the morning, which is a matter of record, uh, means that the, the guarantee was triggered uh, at that night. Uh, not, it was not something which we had asked for. This was a government decision. Okay, and just finally then, can you recall any conversation around the inclusion of subordinated liabilities um, as part of the guarantee? On that night? Yes. Absolutely not. You cannot? I'm, I'm saying I, I, it's not that I can't recall. I can recall that there was no discussion. No discussion. Okay, thank you. Um, I might return then, if I may, to board oversight of risk policies. Yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Crowley, the Group Risk Policy Committee was set up to assist the Board with its risk oversight and governance responsibilities. But did this committee assist with or assume the risk oversight and governance responsibilities? Sorry, I missed the opening. Did it assist with or assume the Group Risk Policy Committee? I missed the opening. Sorry, question. the Group Risk Policy Committee, yeah. which was set up to assist the Board with its risk oversight yeah. and governance responsibilities, did it assist with or assume these responsibilities? Did it assist with or assume these responsibilities? Oh, um, I, it was given these responsibilities. Okay, so it was a, these responsibilities were delegated to the committee? Well, yes, uh, as an added uh, piece of the jigsaw protecting uh, the bank and its credit. Okay. When Mr. Bancho was before us, um, he was asked if there was insufficient oversight on the part of the board in relation to this committee, and he replied, yes, I think so. In you relation come? to? This committee, oversight of the Group Risk yeah. Policy Committee. It, the, the Risk Committee, as I recall, regularly reported to the board at every, at every meeting. So you wouldn't agree that there was insufficient oversight of this committee by the board? No. Mr. Burroughs? Hindsight is a, is a great uh, uh, thing in this situation, and I would say, with hindsight, as I have acknowledged, we would certainly do things differently. At the time, my belief is that there was probably uh, uh, the correct amount of oversight, the correct amount of control, the correct amount of reporting, uh, but certainly in the circumstances that unfolded, a far more rigorous approach would have been justified. <coughs> Mr. Burroughs, do you think you've placed too much trust in senior executives on the board who are also on these credit and risk committees? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think it's, it's a fact that uh, to run any business, uh, a bank included, a board has to delegate uh, its responsibilities to management. That's the way the business gets done. Um, and, uh, and, and so therefore, I, I don't think that there was uh, any question of, uh, of any overestimation of the capabilities of the management. Okay. In, in July 2003, the financial regulator said that the examination raises questions about the maintenance of lending standards in your institution and about your ongoing monitoring, management and control of risk in relation to residential mortgage credit. That's in BOI B1, page 67. Do you recall that criticism from the financial regulator at the time? I don't. To, you don't. Mr. Crowley, do you? No. Okay. Um, can we bring that up, please? Um, do you recall concerns being expressed actually by the Group Risk Policy Committee itself um, in 2004? Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's there at the bottom, if you like, uh, on your screen. This is from the financial regulator. And the, the, the quoted paragraph at the bottom, the examination raises questions about the maintenance of lending standards in your institution and about your ongoing monitoring, management and control of risk in relation to residential mortgage credit. You don't recall this letter from your time on the board? There is a reply to that letter, which went on the 12th of February, 2004. Is that a reply to this? That's that one. Yeah. yeah. Which is not in the core documents. Um, but there is a reply from me to Dr. Liam O'Reilly. There's a reply addressing that concern. Sorry? Addressing that particular concern that's expressed. In your reply, you addressed that concern. I addressed, yeah, there was it, that letter, yeah. Okay. 
Do you remember the actual discussions around this letter at the time on the board? No, I don't remember. Okay. Um, thank you. I'll move on then, if I may. Um, Mr. Crowley, did you ever feel like the bank was under pressure to change its model or its business, given the apparently rapid success of other banks like Anglo-Irish Bank? I don't think that by 2005 there was pressure uh, to change the model. 2005 was the fifth year of continuous profit growth, uh, and everything looked extremely good. Um, it also was the year in which I, I uh, re retired as governor. Uh, so I think we were, in, we believed we were in very good shape at that point. And then after you retired, do you believe that the culture in the bank or the activities of the bank changed? Yeah, no, I, I think they were changing uh, for a number of years. Uh, nothing dramatic, but we, we were changing, particularly with the chief executive we had brought in from the external world uh, rather than from the bank itself. And that was a big contributor to the uh, changing of the culture in the bank. Um, Mr. Burroughs, did you see, in relation to property lending in the bank, did you see your chairmanship as continuing the practices that were already at the bank at a board level, or did you break with the past in some way? Uh, no, I didn't break with the past. Bear in mind I had been part of the uh, board yeah. up to that point. It, it wasn't as if that I uh, uh, arrived <coughs> new on the scene in 2005. Uh, but I think, uh, uh, as I said earlier, uh, in looking at the strategy of the bank uh, with Brian Goggin, who was then a new CEO in position, uh, we did uh, question very thoroughly the strategy which had been put in place by his predecessor and uh, in doing that uh, we brought in quite a number of different uh, external advisors to examine all aspects of the bank's business uh, to make sure that our strategy uh, was robust going forward. So there was a, there was a period of intense questioning uh, during this period of growth of the, uh, of the business of the bank. Was there confusion in the bank um, in 2004 about property lending, as Mr. Boucher stated in his appearance before us? I, I'm not aware of any confusion. I, I don't know what that uh, okay. word implies. So if we could talk about this, this specialised property financing unit that was set up in 2001, the purpose was to write higher risk, higher return property transactions and it also had the following objective, to allow business banking to compete more effectively, in particular with Anglo-Irish Bank. Is this an example of Bank of Ireland changing its business practice to compete with Anglo, Mr. Burroughs? I think the answer to that has been given by my colleague, uh, Lawrence Crowley, in that uh, it was necessary in a more competitive environment to bring the skills and capabilities of management uh, on property lending in particular into one place rather than have uh, generalists dealing with all forms of lending. So the creation of that was, was a response to that. Uh, it, it was also in the context, bear in mind, of, uh, of uh, the strong growth that I referred to in my own uh, opening remarks uh, in the economy generally um, and particularly in the housing and property sector. But do you think there was, uh, you know, particular focus on Anglo-Irish Bank and its activities? No, I don't think there was a particular focus on Anglo-Irish Bank, uh, but we were and are uh, a publicly quoted company, okay. and so therefore uh, we have to have regard to what our institutional shareholders and personal shareholders are saying about us. And the fact of the matter was that uh, in a very fast-growing market, uh, Bank of Ireland was underperforming uh, the other Irish institutions in terms of growth. And so that uh, always led to a, a discussion of whether or not we were uh, taking the right measures in the uh, promotion of the business of the bank. Well, did you increase your risk appetite then for property lending because of what your competitors were doing? No, I don't believe we did. I, I think, if anything, uh, we, we probably tightened. And I referred to uh, specifically our attitude with respect to land bank. Okay. Even though the rationale for setting up the specialised property finance unit was to facilitate in writing higher risk, higher return property transactions. 
Well, that, that was back in, uh, as you said, in 2002. 2001. 2001. 2001. In 2004, that's the creation of a dedicated property unit. Yeah. Um, and that was set up responsible for managing relationships with a total group exposure in excess of 30 million. And the rationale for that was that in the past five years, we've underperformed in this top end market, which has been dominated by banks with specialist property units, most notably Anglo Irish Bank. So is the move to a dedicated property unit in 2004, is this an example for the moment, of Bank of Ireland changing its business practice to compete with Anglo? Well, I think to compete in the marketplace uh, rather than specifically with Anglo. Anglo were certainly the, uh, the, the bank that was um, uh, the most high profile in that area. Uh, so it, it, it's natural to make reference to that, but it wasn't just Anglo. There were lots of other banks competing for the same business as well. Yeah, and, and yet you cite Anglo twice in your minutes over that period of time specifically. And this is in relation to the restructuring of the bank and the establishment of a dedicated property unit that you do cite Anglo. Well, that, that may be the way the, the minutes are written. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the bank had to uh, set up a, a, a specialist unit with the skills and capabilities which would allow it to do that kind of business in a more efficient way. Thank you. Thank you, Chair.